Uh, so um, this is me, uh, and beneath the exterior, uh, standing here before you today, is two terabytes of data. Yep, uh, so my goal is to collect all of this data, and I think today I'm about 40% of the way there. Uh, so uh, if it's two terabytes, that means uh, 12 of me, which is okay, it's a bit scary, is equivalent to Wikipedia. My point is, uh, we humans are data rich. And so the question is, how much of this data can my doctor actually see? Well, as it turns out, not very much. So probably my clinical record or part of my clinical record, which is less than a megabyte, so it's a sort of a toenail uh, size amount of data, uh, plus some imaging, and often it's all incomplete. Uh, in the US, when you visit your doctor, 55% uh, of the time the doctor doesn't have your uh, complete medical history or his data missing, and 49% of the time uh, the doctor will not be aware of what drugs you are on. So health professionals uh, are making decisions on incomplete information. Uh, by the way, that was my doctor back there, Dr. Tam. I'll come to him later on. Um, next, we have some imaging data. So we all have lots of medical images. I have about 30 gigs, I think, at the moment, and it's growing. Uh, at the top are some uh, uh, retinal scans. The next one, the scary picture below, is <laughs> my teeth. Um, the bottom uh, left-hand corner is a hip resurfacing. That's what happens when you run and you don't stretch, OK? And the uh, right-hand side, that's my heart beating. And you see I have blue blood, OK? There we go. <laughs> Um, I also have my partial genome done. I have less than 1% actually uh, via 23andMe. And what I discovered is, is that I have 2.2% um, of my DNA is Neanderthal, okay? <laughs> now, don't you laugh because you guys all have typically 2.7%. Uh, so the way I have uh, interpreted this is that uh, I'm fairly advanced, okay? Uh, not so much you guys. Um, below that, you have my variant file. It's a very sh small part of it. It's many, many megabytes. Um, and so what I learned from my, my variant file is um, I don't process ibuprofen. I don't take it anyhow, but I don't, I don't process it. I learned that I'm good to go for chemotherapy, though, so I have that to look forward to. Uh, I have uh, two variants, uh, singly a nucleotide polymorphism. Uh, uh, one suggests that I should be losing all of my hair. The other one suggests that I should have a full head of hair. So on my scalp today, there's clearly uh, a conflict going on. I think the actual <laughs> hair loss one is winning. Um, there are also some uh, genes that I refer to as entertainment genes. These are, well, the one where people often talk about is called a cheating gene. Uh, this is a male gene, by the way, uh, as you might expect. Uh, and it's from research in Sweden, which suggests that um, if you have this gene, you have twice the probability uh, of having an affair. So girls, before you go dating, you might want to check that one. Uh, there's also one called the positivity gene. Uh, I have this one. Um, that means you're more positive and you can handle uh, stress better. Uh, so at this point, I'd be very interested to see who, who of you in your audience would like to get your genome done. Put up your hands. Well, that's quite a lot. It's about 50, uh, maybe 40%. So that's pretty typical, really. But before you rush off and get your DNA kit, okay, uh, what you might want to know is that um, you can discover all sorts of things you don't want to know. You can discover that you have the APO variant, which means you have a very high probability of getting dementia or the BRCA1 or 2 gene, which is uh, for um, cancer, uh, breast cancer in particular, uh, Huntington's disease, um, so as the list goes on. So uh, first of all, you might discover you have a high, very high propensity for one of these conditions. So you might be able to handle it, but then do you tell your children? Uh, what you almost also might find out is what people found out in France, is one in 10 um, uh, fathers wasn't the father. So that's another thing you want to be a bit careful <laughs> of. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it's not just a French thing, okay? It actually goes to other countries as well, okay? And, 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 and um, actually, generally, when I ask the question again, who wants to uh, get the genome done, usually a lot of hands go down at this particular point. The really interesting thing is uh, when you ask your gen geneticists this question, a lot of them, they're in the business and they have not had their genome done. They have no intention of getting it done because they don't want to find out what they, um, um, yeah, they want to not know. Um, so, um, uh, another area uh, rich in data is your microbiome, um, otherwise known as your, the other human genome. Uh, it's made the front page of The Economist. Uh, so we typically have about one and a half kilograms of bugs in our body. The bugs actually outnumber human cells 10 to 1, and they contribute to uh, 
uh, all sorts of things like uh, obesity, uh, possibly Crohn's disease, allergies and asthma. And there was a view that we are uh, changing our microbiomes uh, via antibiotics, um, food we eat, uh, etc. And by the way, you get your microbiome from all sorts of sites, including your mouth, nose, ears, stomach, and other places, which I won't mention. Um, so uh, um, then next we have is your metabolome. These are the small chemicals found in us. They can be naturally occurring, uh, such as amino acids, uh, fatty acids and sugars, or external uh, compounds such as drugs, contaminants, uh, food additives, and toxins. Now, the interesting thing now is you can measure these. And so I'm looking to get those within the next couple of weeks. Um, another area which is of great interest these days is epigenetics. This is really strange. Uh, so the classic experiment was done by a guy called George Dias. Uh, he took male mice, exposed them to an almond scent. It's a little sadistic, this. And he put electric shock through their feet at the same time. So he did it five times a day for three days. And the male mice eventually froze every time the almond scent came along because they knew what was coming next. Um, these mice eventually mated with female mice who hadn't been exposed to the almond scent or shocks. And their offspring and their offspring all had a raised sensitivity to the almond scent. So that what they concluded, there were chemical changes in the way the DNA was packaged and expressed, but the genome itself hadn't changed. So this is why on the front page of Time magazine it says, your DNA isn't your destiny. And after this, it gets really complicated. You have your genome, which turns into RNA, proteins, and your uh, metabolome, which I've already discussed. Uh, again, all these areas are very, very rich in information. Uh, we're all very familiar with device data. Lots of devices are coming out now. They're getting increasingly uh, more accurate, capturing a lot of information from lots of sites on your body. Um, next, your exposome. So this is, adds environmental factors uh, to your medical record, being climate, pollution, pollen, diet, uh, bad chemicals like PCBs. So there are devices starting to come out now that'll measure those for you. And finally, uh, a really big influence on your health is uh, this social and behavioral uh, stuff. So actual healthcare has only a 10% influence on your health. Uh, what is more important to you is your social circumstances and behavioural choices. So where do you live? The people you hang out with, the food you eat, or whether you have a job, these are very, very important things. So as you can see, our bodies contain a lot of data. So the question is, what can my uh, doctor actually use uh, of that data? It's not very much. Um, and he also has an impossible job, because I, I go and visit him with information from Dr Google, there's missing clinical information. Soon there's going to be a tsunami of new data. There's 17 new academic research papers per day. And the doctor has 15 minutes to make a decision. Um, now, the way he makes decisions is via a thing called evidence-based medicine, which sounds pretty good. But that has had uh, some serious issues. And th this I need to explain. Um, before the 1970s, uh, medicine was termed intuitive medicine. Doctors had um, a certain amount of knowledge and experience, uh, which meant they sort of, uh, the red tablets worked better than the blue tablets, and that's how medicine was practiced. From 1970 onwards, evidence-based medicine uh, took over, where clinical trials would occur. You'd have a, have a control group, and the group you were giving the new drug or procedure or whatever it is, and uh, if it was successful, then a paper would be uh, written, and it would become what's called best practice, which sounds fairly reasonable, really. The problem was a lot of the actual research was flawed. There is a view today that half of the clinical research papers published are flawed or the results cannot be reproduced. Um, one of the worst of these was um, the guideline which suggested the liberal use of beta blockers prior to surgery for anyone undergoing surgery. This was based on flawed research and it took some time to discover. And there is a view that over a five-year period in Europe, there's been 800,000 deaths because of this. And the problem with evidence-based medicine, the trials are rather small. They were time-boxed and often run by organisations where they were quite keen for a positive result, uh, drug companies, etc. 
And now precision medicine has the promise of actually uh, making a big difference here. Instead of having time-bound trials, you can continually be uh, testing statistically, and so precision medicine has a chance of making a big, big difference uh, to how health research is performed. Also, um, the way we practice medicine today is we treat all diabetics the same. So it's called population health, and we use the best evidence for treating a diabetic patient, so all, all diabetics are treated the same. And this is clearly a very flawed concept because you have young, old, seriously less serious patients with other comorbidities, or based on their genome, a propensity for certain things or other things, and some drugs may or may not work. So this is where precision medicine comes in. Every patient uh, should ultimately be treated as unique. It's nicely summed up by Eric Green, who stated, what we think of as modern medicine will look like primitive guesswork. As we start to understand the factors that make a treatment perfect for one person, yet completely ineffective for another. So the challenge today is my medical record is stored in several different locations, and also I can't really access it. And furthermore, there's a whole lot of new data about to arrive, and the question is, where do you put it? Because these systems aren't suitable for storing such large volumes of data. It clearly needs to go into the cloud. Uh, we need to give doctors who have the appropriate security rights and credentials access to it, and I want to have access to it myself. And we need to put some intelligence and deep learning into the cloud to make sense of all this data. And so, first of all, my doctor can access my medical record. We can make suggestions to him with the reasons of backing up each suggestion. And I want to have access to it as well. So I've just discovered that I have 2.3 pounds of internal organ fat. So OK, that's all great. I've, just, I've discovered that it should be two pounds, actually. Um, I'm sure some advice I would get is go to the gym, stop, the, stop drinking the coffee, and, and drink less. Pretty standard advice, really. Uh, the problem is we often don't do what we should. That's because many people uh, don't want to change, or we don't have the resources to change, or health's just not a top priority. So something we need to put back into our medical record is beliefs, motivations, uh, ability, et cetera. And this is fed to our circular care who can help us with our health care. So this is a new model of health. The question we need to answer is when I wake up in the morning, what should my mobile device tell me? And the answer to that question is very different based on how old we are, whether we're te technology literate or not, and um, how many uh, uh, health conditions we have. And if we can answer this question, precision medicine has the potential to totally transform healthcare in much the same way that antibiotics have, uh, hygiene and vaccinations have also. So this is a once in a generational change. Now, if you want to track my journey uh, going forward, I'll be collecting more and more data. You can go to orionhealth.com at digitalme. So um, my next thing I hope to get is my personal avatar. Um, and high resolution. That's coming through in a few weeks' time. I'm sure it's going to be very, very useful. So thank you very much.